Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, U.S. Regulatory Approaches for Packaging. I'm Mary Ann Remolador, the Assistant Director of NERC, the Northeast Recycling Council. We, we are delighted that you have joined us. We have a few details to share with you before starting the webinar. First, everyone has been put on mute uh, to minimize background noise. We invite you to ask questions throughout the webinar. However, we will hold the questions to the uh, end of all of the speakers' time. And we'd like to let you know that the webinar is being recorded. The recording and the presentations will be available by tomorrow afternoon on NERC's website. And the way you would uh, find them is to go to the top banner at www.nerc.org and click on resources and then uh, select webinar. These instructions will be included in the message that you receive tomorrow as well. We have three wonderful speakers today who will share their perspectives and resources about regulatory approaches for packaging. Our first speaker is Cole Rosengren, Senior Editor of Waste Dive, who will provide an overview of the different strategies states have proposed around the nation to deal with packaging and how industry groups have responded. Following Cole is Heidi Sanborn, Executive Director of the National Stewardship Action Council, who will present California's proposed strategies and the implementation steps incorporated in their plan. And then we'll have Sarah Lakeman of the Sustainable Maine. She is the Sustainable Maine Project Director of the Natural Resources Council of Maine. And Sarah will present the specific of Maine's proposed strategies and their intended outcomes. So now I'd like to invite Cole to share his screen. I can see your screen, Cole, and you just have to put it into slide view. All right, thank you, Marianne. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody today. As outlined, uh, my job is to just kick us off with a basic overview of what has happened this year. It's been quite a busy year, and so if I've missed anything, please let me know, uh, either in the comments afterward or via email. We do our best to keep on track with all the various legislation, but there is a lot going on in 2019. A quick overview of what has passed already, to my knowledge. And again, um, this is not going to include any EPR for, uh, say, paint, pharmaceuticals, anything on those lines. We're just focusing on packaging. So one of the biggest trends we've been tracking at Waste Dive on the packaging front is uh, plastic bag bans. Going into this year, as many will know, California, of course, had a statewide policy, and then Hawaii had a de facto statewide policy because all of its counties have uh, various bag bans, but that was it. Nothing else had passed at the state level. Here we are now in September, and a lot has changed. Uh, New York was the first in April as part of its budget negotiations, passed a, uh, a ban on plastic fee on paper that finally allowed New York City to follow along with its own fee on paper. It had been uh, preempted by the state from doing so for multiple years. In June, we uh, had Maine follow suit. Vermont uh, was right after, I believe the bills might have actually been signed on the same day, actually. So New England came up in that. And then uh, Connecticut as well was next in July. Connecticut's was also passed as part of its budget process. Uh, that was a complicated fight around the bag ban in Connecticut. Anyone who's interested can find some details on Waste Dive. Uh, the question about compostable bags got wrapped up in that. Uh, I know not everyone who's involved is happy with the end result, but there is sort of a gradual implementation of a bag uh, policy coming in Connecticut now. Oregon as well signed its own policy, and then uh, Delaware was the last one. Their bill had passed earlier, but the governor chose to wait to sign it to tie it in with some uh, anti-litter initiatives that he signed over the summer. As far as who may be next uh, this year, the only one I'm aware of that could be close is Massachusetts, my home state. Uh, granted, though, Given 
uh, a lot of the complexities around what has happened with that bill. It has changed quite a bit since it was introduced, uh, and as well as our sort of different legislative calendar here in Massachusetts, things uh, can drag on for longer. I have no sense of whether or not that will pass this year, but that's the only one I'm even seeing as a possibility. But either way, things have changed quite a bit from uh, two going into this year to the many that we have now. The other uh, issues we've been tracking on the packaging side, uh, legislatively, uh, foam and straws. So uh, in May, Maine actually became the first state to ban polystyrene foam containers. Uh, Maryland followed uh, without the governor's signature, actually, that just happened um, by default through the legislative process. In June, Vermont uh, took its own steps on foam, straws, and plastic stirs. And then uh, this is more just a cultural uh, and political uh, trend, but straws have really become the hot topic uh, this summer. President Trump is now selling them on his uh, re-election campaign website. A lot of the uh, candidates for the Democratic presidential nomination have been bringing it up during uh, various media appearances, and they're even making an appearance on cable news. We have a picture here of uh, uh, Fox host Laura Ingram, uh, standing by her straws and trying to drink uh, steak through the straws. So they're really uh, a touch point that I think we're going to keep seeing going forward, even more so than bags, perhaps. Straws are really the big thing people are focusing on right now in the packaging world. Though we all know, of course, that these are, well, uh, emblematic and important things to track, the bigger meat of it is coming with uh, EPR bills and various broader legislative uh, changes. And so bear with me, this is the list that perhaps may be incomplete. If I've missed anything, let me know. As far as we know, though, uh, Washington State is in the midst of a uh, plastic study group. That report is due next year. Could potentially lead to some kind of produced responsibility structure. Uh, Maine, as we'll of course hear from Sarah later in the presentation, has passed its own EPR bill. Uh, that report, uh, or excuse me, proposed legislation is due by the end of this year. Vermont as well uh, is on a similar track with a working group report due by the end of the year. So we can expect um, some pretty tangible results from both Maine or Vermont. Uh, granted, we know working groups don't always lead to legislation, so we'll see what happens there. But the folks who are involved in these campaigns sound pretty confident, perhaps more so than in other states in the past. Another one that I don't anticipate will lead to um, any kind of hard legislation, but could lead to further policy discussions is in New Hampshire. The state uh, passed a study bill about just trying to figure out what's going on with recycling programs in general. There have been a lot of um, financial challenges. Uh, some programs have been canceled. New Hampshire doesn't actually have any um, MRFs. Uh, a lot of its material, if not all of its material, is getting shipped out of state. Any, no large single stream MRFs, rather. And so uh, folks in the uh, state agency, as well as the legislature, are looking for solutions there. Plastic has come up as something that they could cover, and we'll see a report on that by the end of the year. At the same time, some EPR discussions did stall out in uh, Connecticut, which, uh, as you may recall, had a, a working group that went forth not too long ago um, and kind of got deadlocked in the end there. But there was uh, an effort, again, to raise that in the legislature this year, did not advance uh, Indiana as well. And Massachusetts, as of now, I have not been hearing any talk about the EPR legislation that could change, though. In Hawaii, they had also considered going farther on some type of plastics policy. Uh, in the end, that became a plastic source reduction working group. Uh, we will see if any specific legislation comes out of that, but that ended up being um, less aggressive than the bill, bill authors had planned. Uh, we've also seen um, the implementation or expansion of bottle bills uh, stall out in multiple states. And to clarify here, this is new legislation. The existing bottle bills are running along and have not been affected, but just an effort to add to that list or perhaps alter the programs and I'm sure uh, CRI, if they're on the line, can correct me if I'm wrong, I have not seen any movement on that this year yet. And then on the flip side, about you know just general types of packaging legislation, uh, preemption bills are still in the works, passed in at least four states, more to come. Uh, and these are bills, the, the language can vary, but essentially uh, ban on bans. They ban local governments from taking any action, uh, usually around plastic bags, sometimes around other containers. We've actually been seeing um, this play out in many different ways, legally and legislatively, in Florida, Texas, and elsewhere. So that's going to be an interesting one. Um, uh, Pennsylvania as well. I know that caught some folks by surprise to see the preemption end up in the state budget this year. Uh, but there's uh, hope for the folks who want to see packaging policies and bag bans in Pennsylvania that, that could turn around next year. Uh, another one to track is uh, quote unquote advanced recycling bills. These are largely uh, supported by the American Chemistry Council, as well as others in the plastics industry, uh, kind of laying the groundwork for chemical recycling. 
which uh, is seen as a potential opportunity to handle uh, flexible packaging and other uh, packaging types that are not commonly accepted in curbside bins at this time. So already there's been quite a bit that has happened this year. What else is on the horizon though? Let's take a look. Uh, the big one, of course, anyone who's following packaging world will know is California. What is going to happen with AB 1080 and SB 54? I know uh, Heidi, who's presenting later, uh, will have more details on this. I'll certainly defer to her on the latest uh, version. Amendments have been coming in fast and furious. I believe Heidi's actually watching the committee hearing right now to get a sense of where this will land. Uh, California's legislative session ends at the end of this week. So if it's going to happen, it will happen this week or it will have to wait till next year. Um, but the basics are major waste reduction targets for single-use products. Um, this is no longer just plastic. This would include multiple types of packaging, a lot of packaging having to go recyclable or compostable. The uh, key details, though, are going to be worked out uh, through kind of a rulemaking process uh, with state agency CalRecycle. So the legislation, as I understand it, will lay the groundwork, but then there are many years ahead uh, for Calor Cycle with advisory groups and stakeholders to work out exactly what this could mean. How will these targets be reached? Will this include EPR? Will this include funding for infrastructure or market development? It's going to be very complex, but given how um, international uh, trade policy has affected the recycling markets, of course, in the U.S., but California has felt that very strongly, given its uh, geographic location, as well as um, some of the higher recycling targets that local jurisdictions are expected to meet. There's a lot of energy and a lot of interest right now to get something figured out in California, also because um, there's been challenges with the bottle bill there as well, as we saw with the recent closure of the largest um, CRV operator, Replanet. So who knows? I am not going to guess on what goes down in California this week. We, we will be tracking it, and if it goes, um, this will certainly have wide-ranging effects in other states is my understanding and even if it doesn't pass i think the fact that this conversation has gotten this far and many um cpg groups and uh waste industry groups and everyone under the sun has had to take a position and get engaged and has moved perhaps more than they would have in the past i think this is going to shift the window so to speak in california it's also worth uh paying attention at the federal level to see what happens um traditionally we don't think of Packaging reg uh, regulation or recycling is being something that happens at the federal level. That's starting to change in the last year or so, um, in part because of all the media attention around plastic, as well as the uh, uh, trade issues with China and other countries. The big one to watch is uh, a bill coming from uh, Lowenthal and Udall here in Congress. It has just been an outline so far. The outline is very broad, included possibility for EPR, bottle bill, uh, product bans, uh, recycled content targets. They've been taking comments. We'll see uh, when that bill comes in, presumably this fall, how much of that ends up in there. And of course, what what uh, remains in that bill if it does progress, but this would re, re, you know, reinitiate a national conversation around packaging regulation in a way that hasn't happened in quite a long time, to my understanding. Also worth watching uh, how this comes up on the campaign trail. Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, he uh, like all the candidates at this point, has a climate plan out. From what I, we can tell at Waste Dive, though, his plan um, has the most specific details about uh, the recycling world. There's hints of an EPR program, recycled content requirements, among other things. So who knows uh, as well how that will play out, but depending on who gets the nomination, of course, uh, the results of the election next fall. This could also play into uh, the White House. Another one to watch, um, not as directly related, but relevant, um, is Representative Ilhan Omar's Zero Waste Act. This is building on similar Zero Waste Act um, by her predecessor, Keith Ellison. Uh, basically money, grant funding for local governments to implement a range of programs around food waste and recycling. Uh, there's some talk of packaging reduction in her bill. And then some smaller ones, well, this next one is smaller, uh, Rep Quigley, he wants to reinstate the ban on plastic water bottles, national parks. And then the next one, I should say, would definitely be large, depending on the details. Um, this is backed by the plastics industry and others. Uh, the Recover Act, the idea of uh, getting, you know, if an infrastructure uh, discussion happens in Congress, how to get some of that money into the recycling industry uh, would be very intriguing and would have a lot of implications for packaging. So that, that brings us to uh, lots in the air, a lot has passed, a lot could pass. What are we hearing uh, from the folks who have a stake in this? Uh, at the regulatory and then the, uh, in the private sector. The largest effort I've seen to date was last year, um, the EPA hosted its America Recycles Day Summit in November, do all the big names, uh, Coke, Pepsi, Waste Management, Republic Services, you name it, there are dozens of folks around the table there 
all uh, professing their desire to find a solution, signing a voluntary pledge to work together uh, with EPA on uh, multiple key areas around measurement, education, market development, and infrastructure. They've got a progress report that came out over the summer with um, a lot of things that are in the works, nothing too tangible. Uh, we can expect, though, some type of plan or update uh, on America Recycles Day this year in November. Uh, and seeing increasingly ambitious targets from the consumer packaging companies. Um, a lot of goals, 2025, 2030, beyond uh, making, you know, packaging X percent recyclable by this date or using X percent recycled content or many other uh, large lofty goals that will be interesting to see how they come to fruition and what that means. In terms of, you know, direct uh, financial support, uh, we're seeing a lot of um, voluntary initiatives, uh, funds going to groups such as the Recycling Partnership, Closed Loop Fund, Sustainable Packaging Coalition, Keep America Beautiful, who I recognize come at this from a, a a lot of different perspectives, not to say they're all the same in one category, but essentially uh, manufacturers and some folks in the recycling industry saying, yes, we want to be involved. We want to influence this process outside of a regulatory structure financially or, you know, through in-kind support. Also seeing some uh, pilots backed by uh, various trade associations, a couple come to mind, um, backed by the plastics industry, uh, one around recovering flexible packaging in a MRF in Pennsylvania, another one uh, around aggregating tonnage from multiple MRFs in the Portland, Oregon region, and then running it through a secondary MRF process to capture uh, different types of plastic that are traditionally not ending up in bales right now. And then finally, uh, it's worth watching where the uh, official positions are for many of these companies. And again, if these positions have shifted, perhaps even this week in California, please do let me know. But far as I know, uh, consumer packaging companies in the U.S. are still largely averse to specific EPR policies. Again, I have heard some softening of that language in conversations and reading articles, but I have yet to see anyone jump out to the front of the pack and say, yes, we support this. Um, that being said, they are, of course, working in some types of EPR structures in other countries right now and could adapt in the U.S. if they uh, had to or chose to, but at the moment are still on the fence with that. Some of the larger uh, waste recycling industry trade associations remain opposed. ISRI, the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries, uh, has official policy that they do not support EPR. They support a competitive uh, system, open market, National Waste and Recycling Association, which represents uh, the haulers and the MRF operators, similar position. Uh, and we're also seeing this, this is not new this year, but it's worth noting that some of the largest waste and recycling companies do recognize this as, um, you know, regulation they want to communicate to their shareholders that they are following and tracking. Uh, found instances of this in the uh, annual filings, the 10Ks for waste management, waste connections, and uh, Xala waste systems. They all are, uh, you know, paying close attention to what happens with EPR. The general uh, response and sense of, be it a bottle bill or some kind of broader EPR system, there's a anxiety about losing control of the system, you know, either losing tonnage, losing financial stake, uh, having to comply with regulations, perhaps losing market share. That is my sense of their general opposition at this time. And with that, I'm excited to hear more about what's happening in uh, Maine and California, and I'm glad to take questions at the end. Thank you, Cole. Okay, I'm gonna switch the screen now to Heidi. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. And I think the your Wonderful. Well, thank you again uh, so much for having us on this webinar. Obviously, it's a hot topic. There's a lot of people on. Um, and it's in a very important time uh, in the world dealing with plastics. So I'll talk today a lot about how we're trying to solve the plastic packaging or the packaging problem in California. And literally, as Cole mentioned, I was on the uh, listening to the webinar literally until and the broadcast of the uh, committee hearing in California on the bill. It did just get out of the Assembly Natural Resources Committee with a six to two vote. So it's still alive and uh, going to uh, for a floor vote and then to the governor. So I'll give you an update on that bill and the latest ins and outs. And again, I've been talking about packaging and producer responsibility for 12 years now. Um, most recently, I did the Environmental Council of the States presentation in D.C., was asked about the China sword. I told them I'll talk about it for three minutes at the tops because it's not about China, it's about us. 
we have allowed our infrastructure to be exported and we're paying a very high price because now we have really let our infrastructure rot and we need to build it up. We, we've become really good at collecting and shipping, but not very good at collecting and then having the remanufacturing here. So delighted again to be talking about this and spoke about it also in Paris um, at the Global Product Stewardship Council meeting in July. So uh, the National Stewardship Action Council, we are a 501c4 and we are affiliated with the California Product Stewardship Council, which I was the founding director. And we are a network of proponents for a circular economy. And our vision is that we achieve that circular economy through collaboration with stakeholders and through EPR approaches. This is uh, our planning, strategic planning meeting in 2017. So a lot of people throw the term circular economy around, but I do want to say that uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation has done, I think, the best job of explaining what the circular economy is. It's a multifaceted approach, basically, that we're focusing on the producers to embrace sustainable design and using regenerative materials and collecting end-of-life products and materials for continuous use in the economy. So again, the three principles are design out waste and pollution, which is source reduction, keep products and materials in use, and then regenerate natural systems. Uh, while our bill in California is called the circular economy bill, I think it very clearly meets the test of one and two. Not sure we're meeting the test three, but um, that is to be determined because there's still a lot, um, you know, we'll see how this plays out. So we formed uh, four years ago at the national level, and we can basically lobby in any state in the country and advocate and partner with businesses that want to try new things. And our first uh, effort was successful in Cook County, Illinois, in passing a medicine producer responsibility bill. Unfortunately, the funding was delayed, and that still hasn't happened as far as the producers are really paying for it. So we're still working on that. Uh, in 2017, we passed in California a carpet cleanup bill to an advanced recycling fee handed to industry program that was passed in 2010. But it was a very important, and I don't have time to get into the details of that, um, but 2018 was our big EPR bill, first in the U.S., with the drug companies and needle manufacturers being responsible for now for the whole state of California to implement safe medicine and needle collection and management and, and uh, also promote those programs. And then on the governor's desk now, we just got two bills to the governor's desk in the last two days. One is on household hazardous waste reuse and encouraging that a lot more, getting rules out of the way that prevented it. And then also uh, our second and last <laughs> carpet cleanup bill, AB 729, to protect our California fee money. So if they lose control of the program from the industry, we can get that money back to California to fund our infrastructure. And I just wanna say that when these bills are effective and work, they do drive jobs. We did end up with uh, Aquafil. I'm there with the president on the left, uh, Giulio Bonazzi, and on the right, the president of um, the USA division uh, there in Slovenia with their, their zero emissions plant that's cradle to cradle that takes nylon fishnets, nylon carpet, nylon, products of any type and makes them into pellets to be made into the next version of product. So these can work and help create infrastructure. And uh, obviously we, we need that in the US. So producer responsibility, what people refer to as producer responsibility, we have, there, it goes from really 100% producer funded to very little, if any, producer funding. And just quickly, I will say that, you know, there are people that call our bottle bill in California producer responsibility. It is absolutely not. They've got a small little payment to the program that does not at all fund it. They don't run it. They don't design it. None of that. Um, but then you've got those programs on the left, like we have for the pharmaceuticals and sharps I just talked about, where it's 100 percent industry funded, designed and operated. And the government just runs the over oversight. So it's a much smaller government approach, but you've got to give the government the tools to keep the programs working. So I just want to highlight that. Uh, so the first EPR program we passed in California was on mercury thermostats in 20, 2008. That was true EPR internalized costs. 
And the next big one, of course, was SB212, the one I just spoke about with medications and sharps. And the ones in between are where our legislature, in my opinion, was not fully educated about what producer responsibility is. And they were trying new things, um, which we supported because we wanted to get things going. We did it on paint and carpet and mattresses, but all of these have had some level of issues when you hand a visible consumer fee to often out of state industry groups. How do you get your fee money back if you take control away from the program from those groups? How do you uh, do you prevent, because this has happened to us with paint care, literally suing the state with the fee money because they don't like the oversight. Uh, we got that just prevented on carpet and on mattresses. How do you keep them from, um, well, actually on mattresses, they got it out of the bill that just passed and landed on the governor's desk so they can still sue the state against um, what we suggested and what passed in carpet. There's a lot of details. The devil lives in the details of these bills. So I want to make that perfectly clear. And if you want to look at these bills, we're happy to help you because we need more of them, but we need them to go right. This is a 2010 picture of how many stewardship programs there were in Canada. It's amazing. And now in just British Columbia alone, the little province on the far left bottom, they now have 22 EPR programs, everything from packaging and uh, bottles and cans. They have two separate programs because bottles and cans was first, they layered uh, the rest of packaging to the side of it because it was working well. Um, but to all kinds of pesticides, et cetera, oil and many other products. And it really does work there, but they've kind of refined it. And in California, the big driver has been, I, I would say what started this last year was Recology. Um, Recology sits on our CPSC board. They are a privately owned, employee owned company. And their president, Mike San Giacomo, made this statement in the media. He feels that we're out of time as the planet's oceans and wildlife are overrun with plastic. And he basically said, we are prepared to commit a million dollars towards a signature gathering effort to that end and will work with all of those who are willing to move this effort forward. And that is related to a comprehensive plastics policy. So he was basically saying, if the legislature does nothing, we're gonna put something on the ballot because, and that really changed the game. That's when the bills really started to move. Now we knew at the California Product Stewardship Council and at National that we needed to do more education of our legislators. So we literally joined the California Foundation for the Environment and the Economy, and we did a co-hosted study trip. And this is the picture that we took in Vancouver, literally at the end of July, and those people, include seven legislators, the state treasurer of California, Fiona Ma, Recology, um, AMC, one of the plastics manufacturers, and, and uh, Jared Blumenfeld, the uh, secretary of Cal EPA. We were at a Merlin's plastics plant in this picture, but we also toured and met with uh, Vancouver Metro and others. And then we went to Seattle and learned how they've got four EPR bills and they were looking at packaging. The reason I'm showing you this slide is I can't tell you the value that came from this. Um, it was incredible. These legislators, including Senator Ben Allen and Senator Skinner, who are co-authors of these packaging bills, they learned a lot. And they uh, and Mike and Mr. Uh, Bob Wykowski as well, some member Wykowski. So I would highly recommend you do this. If you're interested in doing something like this, let me know. It was fantastic, and we're going to do it again. Um, and I believe it influenced our packaging bills strongly. Um, I wanna get back real quickly to California passed over, you know, it's 30 years ago, uh, in 1989, we passed 8939, and that was the waste, the beginning of our waste hierarchy that put source reduction first before recycling and composting. But if you do not measure it, you're not gonna manage it. And that's what happened is we never measured source reduction, so we never did it. We got better at recycling, but we never did source reduction. And that's what these bills are doing now. So we all know the problems with packaging. There's too many kinds of resins of plastics. They're not labeled the same. Um, that It's just such a problem. And then we've got number sevens, which are other types of plastics. So there's even more types in one category. 
it's too much. The consumers are confused. They don't know how to recycle what's in, what's out, what's got a market. And so, you know, in our state, it's been a really big effort through the Ocean Protection Council. You can see the before and after pictures of a beach in Santa Monica. The one on the left is after a, a rainstorm, which flushes all those plastics out into the ocean. And it just really drives the public to be extremely upset, which is where they are right now. So the ocean uh, litter prevention strategy and packaging um, bills are where this has all been bubbling up for a long time. And of course, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the G7 countries are now engaged in this and Canada and Europe are working on it too. So where are we in California? Well, the previous packaging bills I listed here include the bottle bill originally, which as Cole mentioned, has serious problems. We just saw 750 jobs and locations in the state for what used to be more convenient collection. It's a big mess. And that discussion is actually in the packaging bills, which I'll bring up in a minute. And same with the rigid plastic packaging container law. Um, that was trying to get at source reduction, had some, some impact certainly, um, but that's also in the packaging law now, and I'll reference that in a minute. Then we, we did EPR for ag pesticide containers. Um, in 2008, a very focused group of containers impregnated with pesticides that you do not want to be have recycled into baby bottles and other things. Um, but that was the only EPR we did for packaging. There was a plastic bag ban. Uh, and then also last year, they passed a bill that requires any restaurant to ask or you have to request a plastic straw if you if you want one. And that has raised a lot of awareness. So what we've got now is AB 54 and AB 1080. They are companion bills. Obviously one's, oh, and I put AB, it should have been SB 54, Senator Allen. Sorry about that. Um, but so they're companion bills on other sides of the, um, shoot, I'm sorry. Not in the middle of my call. Um, so we had uh, companion bills in the different houses, and they are exactly the same. Um, and that was to make sure if one got stuck, the other would keep moving. And they were amended as late as yesterday. So I've I was up late and early this morning trying to update this PowerPoint for you to make sure I was completely clear on what the bills were doing. Um, they have to be to the governor basically by midnight Friday. And if and that because they were amended yesterday, they have to go all the way back to the original policy committees, which is where they the uh, SB 54 was just heard this morning right before this webinar and got out with a 6-2 vote because it had to go all the way back through that policy committee. And I can talk a little bit about um, the testimony and the support and opposition. But there are many, many, many groups working in support of these bills. It's been a very, very heavy lift. Um, it's huge, massive, and everybody's really trying to come together to make it work. And I'm very, very proud of all these groups. Uh, the opposition is very limited, really. Um, and I'll talk in a minute about, about what their, uh, Cole actually mentioned the key issues that they're bringing up. The, haul, uh, the haulers are split. Um, we've got uh, Republic testified in support today, and then we had um, the small haulers, California uh, Refuse Recycling Council, actually testify in opposition. They don't want to be in opposition, but they're very worried about EPR, as Cole mentioned. But look at all these amendments, and look at all these authors. That's a lot of authors. So that tells you this has a lot of traction. Um, I'm giving this, um, it's it's a good probably over it's probably 60 percent chance this is going to go right now uh and get to the governor and get signed because cal recycle testified at the hearing just an hour ago that they can implement this bill so what does it do it's called the california circular economy and pollution prevention act and the general requirements are that it's going to impose a comprehensive regulatory scheme on the producers retailers and wholesalers of single-use packaging and priority single-use products to be administered by Cal Recycle. It requires producers to source reduce single-use packaging and priority single-use products. Two, all the products are recyclable and compostable by 2030, 
and three, it's going to achieve statewide 75% waste reduction by 2030, and they have to maintain that. And it's going to authorize CalRecycle to determine which actions to take to achieve those requirements. What that means is the legislature is going to let CalRecycle determine which policy approach to take, whether it's EPR or bans or recycled content or uh, combinations of any and all of those and more. Uh, that's really left up to CalRecycle, and that's a lot of authority, which was part of the concern of some of the opponents today. Continued CalRecycle requirements. It's going to establish a circular economy and waste pollution reduction panel. Uh, they're going to develop criteria to determine whether the packaging or priority single-use products are reusable, recyclable, or compostable. It's going to require development of an implementation plan by 2023. Also, they're going to have to establish and post a list of packaging categories before the regulations are done. And the regulations must be finished by 2024, which is actually a ways out. They're usually a two-year process, but knowing the massive size of these regs, they pushed it out to 2024 as the latest they can be finished. Now, further cow recycle requirements. They must publish a list of recycling rates by category by the first uh, January 1st of 2025, and then they have to update that every two years. They're gonna be required to develop criteria for exempting small businesses, a de minimis um, language, and they're gonna have to set regulatory fees to be paid by the producers. They're only gonna be allowed to establish fees that cover their costs. They cannot make money off this. And they have to report to the legislature every three years on the progress of the program. And they're authorized, as I said, to adopt these regulations establishing a stewardship program. Um, the retailers are required, basically they're prohibited from, uh, or a wholesaler, a retailer or wholesaler, are prohibited from offering for sale any kind of package or single-use product if the producer of those, of the package or product is listed as non-compliant with this law uh, as listed on CalRecycle's website. So CalRecycle has to post the non-compliant companies and the retailers will not be allowed to sell those products if they are non-compliant. So the producer requirements, they're going to have to meet recycling rates based on um, the date of manufacture and they will increase over time. In the amendments, it's going to be 30% recycling rate by 2026, but they are not going to be fined in 2026. It looks like it's only going to be a notice of violation. Um, and 40% recycling rate by 2028, and then meet the full 75% by 2030. The producers will be authorized um, if CalRecycle chooses to establish EPR under the regs, it will be authorized to collectively form a stewardship organization that adopts a stewardship plan or they could do their own individual plan. It's up to them. On enforcement, uh, this I think uh, really was something I pushed very hard for because we know with pharmaceuticals, it was critical to ensure when you have large manufacturers with big lobbying budgets, you have a big hammer. And CalRecycle has now the same hammer we got in SB212, which is they can impose up to $50,000 a day fines for a violation on any entity that is not in compliance with the act. So it's up to, but that's a big hammer. I'm very pleased with that to keep these programs working. Hopefully they won't have to use it. Um, and of course, everybody asks for local preemption of ordinances, et cetera. But because these deadlines are so far out, uh, we and others made it very clear, you better not preempt local governments from having to protect their public health and the environment in the meantime. So the only preemption that's in the bill is are really these two things that the grocers asked for. One is from requiring grocery stores to use a certain type of food packaging unless the majority of households have access to curbside. So basically it's saying local governments cannot ban um, or require grocery stores to have compostable packaging if they don't have a composting program that can take them. The other one is that uh, it would require the grocery stores 
if any local guard, they, they're banned from requiring grocery stores to use food packaging containers that do not meet ASTM requirements. And what we got in the bill and fought very hard for, and we're delighted the authors accepted it, was that um, this does not prohibit a local agency from requiring grocery stores to use food packaging that's refillable and reusable. Because we get back to source reduction, we want to get back to refillable and reusable packages, and we didn't want that banned um, by mistake or inadvertently through this language. So that's in the bill. So what's next? Uh, as Cole said, we've got national legislation. We're working with Senator Udall and Alan Lowenthal, uh, Representative Lowenthal's office. He, Mr. Lowenthal, he came from Long Beach, California, so we know him well. Um, been working with them on this and provided comments on their bill that's coming. And we also have been working, even though it's hazardous waste, on uh, refillable one-pound propane cylinders in California. They're now rolled out at all the U-Hauls, but we're looking at legislation that might ban the sale of disposables completely. It's a very wasteful product as a single-use product. So we should be thinking about our hazardous waste packaging as well as our uh, non-hazardous. Um, and then we'll, of course, be talking to Amazon. <laughs> we all need to. Um, so again, what should we do? We've got to shift to a circular economy and we've got to do it quickly. So we appreciate all of you. Um, all Everyone is needed. Uh, we've all got a lot of hard work and nothing worth having is going to come easy. So uh, this is our social media platforms. We encourage you to follow us. And we've also got a couple of upcoming webinars that you're welcome to join us for through that link. And I'm happy to take questions um, and help anyone uh, understand what's going on not only in California but in other parts of the world. So thank you very much and I'll turn it back over to uh, Marianne. Thank you Heidi. So now we'll switch things over to Sarah Lakeman. All right, can you hear me? you're good to go. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you to NERC and um, for the invitation to present and thanks to you all for taking time out of your day to listen to this webinar. Um, EPR for packaging has been on my and NRCM's um, more long-term policy wish list for many years uh, because it conceptually makes so much more sense than how we currently approach recycling in Maine and elsewhere. Um, but circumstances being what they are and um, you know, watching Maine's municipal recycling program struggle and many fall apart, uh, we feel that it's time to really expedite the process and pass it in Maine as soon as possible. So I'm really excited to fill you all in on what we've been doing here. Okay, so for my presentation, I'm going to start with a few slides uh, that provide some context for EPR in Maine, and then we can spend a little time in the weeds and talk about the details of what our proposal is shaping up to look like, and then I'll describe a bit more about why this policy is the way to go and how people are reacting to it so far in Maine. So this slide um, lists Maine's existing EPR programs dating back over 40 years, uh, beginning with our bottle bill. Um, so as you can see, this concept that Maine people, municipalities, decision makers, and our Department of Environmental Protection, our DEP, um, are very familiar with. Uh, it's actually part of my job to um, monitor uh, these programs and suggest new programs um, for Maine. Okay, so, um, in fact, we're so invested in this policy approach that we have a rather unique framework law in place that establishes that it is a policy of the state to use EPR if certain criteria are met. Um, basically, if a product category like packaging, for instance, is toxic, um, if voluntary efforts to collect and recycle aren't effective, um, if it would reduce costs to local governments and it's been successful in other jurisdictions, then that product category is a prime candidate. Um, one of the best parts about this framework law is that it establishes an annual report to the legislature by DEP that evaluates all the existing programs and provides a means for our Environment and Natural Resources Committee uh, to introduce legislation to fix any programs or to propose new product categories as recommended by the DEP. So um, in the 2019 annual report, which you can Google or I'm happy to send to you, um, the DP has an in-depth section regarding packaging as a prime candidate and their recommendation that the legislature add it to our um, EPR policy suite in Maine. 
Let's see. Okay. So uh, this year, there was a flurry of activity um, during the first half of the 2019-2020 legislative session. Um, right now, the legislature is adjourned, but we'll come back in January to finish out the two-year session. Um, and I will say we were uh, active on um, actively participating in the plastic bag ban and foam ban that passed this year. I'm just here including um, the EPR programs. So I wish that I could talk about each of these uh, policy proposals more, but I'm going to focus um, just on LD 1431, um, which is the resolve to support municipal recycling programs and why we're all here. Um, I will note that this was a separate bill and um, not a bill that was born out of the DEP's annual report to the legislature that I was just um, talking about. Uh, they happen to complement each other quite nicely though. Okay, so uh, this resolve bill is different than a resolution, um, you know, where a government entity can just declare support for something. This resolve is a bill that requires further action and specific action in this case, which is to require that Maine's DEP present full statutory language that would establish an EPR law for packaging and present it to the committee by December 16th. Um, the resolve bill, which you can read online or I can send to you, um, provides a general framework that DEP must use at a minimum, which includes that the proposal be a shared responsibility model between municipalities and producers over a full responsibility model. Um, this is a significant detail, um, as uh, many of you are aware. And uh, this approach is right for Maine because it would be far less disruptive to existing infrastructure, um, existing investment and contracts with haulers and waste facilities. Um, we also feel that uh, the shared approach would provide more transparency and accountability. Um, and I'll talk more about this and the eco-modulated fees in a bit more detail. Um, so there was a public hearing in which many municipalities, um, a municipal association, environmental organizations, recycling facilities came in support. Um, it passed the committee and legislature unanimously and the governor signed it. Um, and I do encourage you to visit the bill page to read the full language and all the uh, testimony materials um, as well as the 2019 uh, product stewardship report if you want to know more details about how we got here. Um, okay, so um, that bill's led to what's happening now. Um, set a few things in motion so you can imagine um, and basically indicated to everyone that the state of Maine is serious about passing an EPR for packaging law out, as outlined by the resolve. Um, so the RDEP is tasked with the hardest job of writing the bill um, but they have decades of experience in our framework law to guide them um, and they're currently holding meetings throughout the state and have invited all stakeholders to comment and provide feedback on their approach. Um, NRCM, um, as the state's leading environmental advocacy organization and instigator behind LD 1431, we have rolled out our uh, Recycling Reform for Maine campaign, which I'll tell you more about in a bit. Um, and also the Maine Municipal Association is very engaged and is hosting a meeting for all municipal officials at the end of the month. So now to my favorite part, um, the weeds. Um, and I hope that you all like to geek out about it as much as I do. So let's see, we'll start with a uh, bottle bill. So LD 1431 already specified that our EPR for packaging law cannot include beverage containers that are already being recovered and recycled through our bottle bill program. Uh, Maine's program is very successful and really part of our culture here. Um, the deposit return program yields a very high return rate, high quality materials that the markets depend on and many businesses um, Small businesses throughout the state rely on this program as well. Um, conceptually, there is no way that taking these containers out of the program and putting them into an EPR program would increase return rates or quality, um, and instead it would likely have the opposite effect. So this is why beverage containers must remain separate as they have been for over 40 years. Um, and I do also want to say thank goodness for the bottle bill because that is the only recycling program available in a growing number of main towns. Okay, so um, LD 1431 also mandates uh, eco-modulated fee structure. So this is really important, um, you know, a cost shift away from municipalities and taxpayers and towards the producers of the problem is only part of the solution, um, but how producers pay into the system is really where the magic happens um, and how we can begin to tackle um, some of the biggest problems with how we currently approach recycling. So these, uh, this type of fee structure basically means that we want to set fees in a way that encourages waste reduction, reuse, and recycling, um, either through bonuses for doing the right things or penalties for doing the wrong things. Um, the Producer Responsibility Organization, which I usually refer to as a PRO, um, would set the level of the fees, but our statute could dictate how they do that. 
Um, DEP hasn't released the exact language for this section yet, but um, what I've described here on the slide is what we've recommended that they include. Um, and I will also note that uh, the statute, if passed, would prescribe this type of fee structure, fee structure, and then the PRO would have to come up with a more specific fee setting proposal uh, that would have to be approved by the DEP for more uh, before implementation. So there's a system of kind of a, a check system there. Okay, so, um, you know, ensuring the right things happen um, brings me to this slide. So uh, Maine's EPR packaging program will need to have a great deal of transparency and data collection so that we can ensure its effectiveness. Um, you know, studying EPR for packaging policies in other jurisdictions around the world, um, we've really identified this as a common problem that we want to avoid in Maine. Um, so we're really eager to see DEP's proposed statutory language that ensures the gathering of clear and transparent data that will include, at a minimum, um, regular waste characterization studies for uh, trash, recycling, litter, um, and these audits must be paid for by the PRO and organized by container type, material type, and brand. Um, I, I feel, really feel that Collecting data in this way will help us to identify free riders in the system, uh, common contaminants, sources of litter, and um, allow us to make future improvements to the law. Um, we also need to include a reporting process that verifies recycling by tracking material in and material out of a facility and to the next processor at least. Um, you know, basically we're flagging that material delivered as recycling to a facility it doesn't mean it actually gets recycled. Um, and this also begs the question of how we define recycling, um, which is all still to be determined here in Maine. Okay, so um, I'll spend a little time on this slide because there's a lot to, to talk about. So, um, you know, like with any policy, as what Heidi said, the devil's in the details. Um, I've listed here some important ones that I know our DEP is actively gathering feedback on, um, and I'll run through them as quickly as I can with my take um, and encourage anyone on the webinar to provide any insight to uh, DEP as well. So the first is uh, readily recyclable. Um, this particular definition is very important because it will greatly impact the fee structure and will provide the basis for determining the greatest opportunity for expanding uh, recycling infrastructure in Maine. Uh, NRCM believes that the definition should be multifaceted and based on access, convenience, and the ultimate end use of the material. Um, so for instance, uh, say 90% of the population must have access to recycle each material type that is just as or more convenient than um, disposing of it as waste. Um, and two, that the material type is third party verified to have been recycled um, as defined by the apart department. We don't know what that definition is yet. Um, and we feel it's very important to make sure that the recyclable definition uh, applies to the whole state and not just to percent of population, um, which is a, is a common flaw uh, with how it's treated now. Um, so, you know, since most of our people in Maine live in two counties, it would be easy to meet just a flat percent target. Um, but uh, just and also, you know, just because a community provides access, it doesn't mean it's convenient or that that gets recycled. Um, so it's really misleading if we don't include more um, more aspects. So, okay, next, um, defining small producer in a way that provides the most participation and equity, the fewest free riders, but does not overburden main small businesses is really important to us. So. Um, our suggested language is similar to what they do in British Columbia, um, but paired back a little for Maine. So um, we think that uh, it should be, you know, criteria based. And one could be that they generate, the producer generates less than say half a million dollars in annual revenues or less than a hundred pounds of packaging materials supplied to Maine, mes Maine residents. Um, they operate as a single point of retail sale and are not supplied by or operated as part of a franchise or, um, or a registered charity. So we'll see um, what we end up with there. So the packaging uh, definition is also very important, of course, um, and we can use any number of examples from around the world, but um, NRCM is suggesting that not only should the definition cover the materials that wrap and protect the products throughout its journey to the home, um, but also cover packaging-like products. Um, these are items that resemble packaging, um, but that are sold as a product, such as aluminum pie plates, uh, beverage cups, sandwich bags, um, cardboard boxes for moving, and things like that. So, um, all right, so next, uh, some of our recycling facilities have said that they acknowledge that this law would be a great way to support municipalities, uh, but they're concerned with how the facilities themselves could be reimbursed for any costs incurred um, since their contracts were negotiated without this law in place. Um, so there's a couple of ways we could address this, um, either through, you know, their standard 
typically standard contract renegotiation language upon a new law, um, or perhaps we could create a way that facilities could apply for reimbursement um, from the PRO for excessive costs until the expiration of a contract. Um, either way, this is just an issue that we need to um, figure out in Maine. Um, and these last two um, I'll talk about in tandem. So we want to find a way that municipalities can help with managing the non, um, they, they can get help with managing the non-recyclable packaging um, that they're sure to receive um, without necessarily getting a subsidy that ultimately makes disposal cheaper. Um, either way, NRCM would like to see payments made to municipalities above the cost of recycling to be used for expanding access to convenient, um, easy recycling. So let's see, let's switch modes here um, into advocacy mode. Um, so uh, I just want to finish up by telling you more about our Recycling Reform for Maine campaign. And um, for those of you who are familiar with Maine, um, you can't get there from here is a phrase used by Mainers, particularly if you ask someone on the side of the road for directions. So um, that message resonates here, even though it might not for you. Okay. So um, if you go to uh, recyclingreform.org, you'll be directed to NRCM's website where you'll find our campaign materials, including our citizen petition, um, municipal resolution language, and, um, and more. And you'll also find out um, how you can see more of our uh, newly hired mascot, Boxy McBoxface, uh, who is on a mission to reform recycling in Maine through EPR for packaging legislation. Um, and if you're not familiar with Bodie McBoatface, you should Google that also. Um, so with the next three slides, um, I'll run through our chosen tagline and underpin for you why this approach to recycling is really needed. Okay, so um, we really believe this policy will make recycling more effective. Um, lack of coordination between producers of packaging and the municipal recycling operators is a fundamental flaw in how we approach recycling. Um, when we create a system of shared responsibility with actual communication between the players, uh, we are moving toward a circular economy and hopefully we will get some design changes that will make recycling easier to do. Uh, recycling reform will make our programs more sustainable too. Um, due to unforeseen costs, uh, many main towns are being forced to stop, cut back, or pay more for their recycling programs. And we are seeing this happen all over Maine. Um, and you know, we can look to our neighbors in the north in Quebec and their municipalities really have not had the same experience because of this insurance policy insurance policy essentially created by the uh, EPR for packaging program there. So, you know, right now um, towns change their programs all the time depending on what they can move for profit and this approach is definitely not conducive to an informed public um, and recycling is very confusing and changing all the time and we really need to make our programs more consistent and um, resilient. Let's see. And finally, um, EPR for packaging will make recycling in Maine um, much more equitable. Recycling relies too much on the people who have the least control, which are Maine's taxpayers. Um, it is absolutely not fair that the taxpayers and municipalities have to pay so much money to manage all this packaging material that they did not create. And it's really not a small amount either. Um, DEP estimates that Maine taxpayers spend 16 to 17 and a half million dollars each year on managing packaging waste. And Maine communities want to recycle because it's the right thing to do and some are willing to pay, but others really cannot afford it. And you know, further, how the producers would pay into the system through the eco-modulated fees is equitable too. Okay, so um, I'm about finished up, but I wanted to report that this concept is definitely catching on in Maine. Um, I've honestly been blown away with how quickly the average person understands such a complicated law. Um, and I think it's because involving the producers and helping to manage the waste created by their business makes total sense. And the way we are currently doing things does not. Um, and it's really no wonder why we currently landfill way more than we're recycling. Um, so here's some examples of the comments we've received on our petition, um, which is at around 1200 signatures so far. Um, and we've received some very favorable press um, so far to um, including this one from the Portland Press Herald's editorial board. So I will leave it at that and um, happily take questions. Um, so thanks again for taking the time to, to listen in and um, Talk to you soon. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a few questions, so I'll get right in to them. Uh, the first one is for Cole, and it has to do with uh, Vermont's straw ban. And um, the question is, how is Vermont in compliance with the ADA requirements if they completely ban the straws? instead of asking, uh, using the ask for a straw approach. 
Thanks, Marianne. Um, it's a great question. I will uh, be honest, I don't know. I'm happy to follow up um, on that. If you want to come back to me in a couple minutes, I can pull up the bill. I would imagine, based on my understanding, that um, ADA uh, concerns and um, compliance has been recognized. But come back to me in a couple minutes. I'll have an answer for you. Sure. Okay. And then for Heidi, um, does the, the bill, and I'm assuming it was the last bill that you referred to, define recycling and recycling rate, and how will it be measured? Okay. <clears throat> I've got the bill right in front of me. So let me take a look because, again, everything is moving at lightning speed. Um, it might, let me see. Okay, so I'm in the definitions section. Does it define recycling? And then source reduction is defined. I don't see recycling defined, but that could be that it's already defined in law. So I have to get back to you on that. Um, and then what was the question about the rates? How will it be measured? Um, well, I mean, basically everything is going to be up for debate in the regulations process. I mean, this bill is kicking a lot to Cal Recycle. So in that regulations process, they're, they're probably if they haven't got clear definitions in existing law, then they're going to define these things and have to figure out exactly how this will all be calculated. Okay. So I, I, I wouldn't, I could not answer that at this moment. Um, and okay. I, I think my, I think the answer is that it's going to be in the regs. Debate. So there's another mission question for you, Heidi. Uh, what is meant by producers? Is it the producers of packaging or of the packaging materials? Um, it is defined, let me look at this. Defined packaging, producer. The definition in the law is, producer means the person who manufactures the single use packaging or priority single use product under that person's own name or brand and who sells or offers for sale the packaging or priority single-use product in the state. So it's basically the, the manufacturer of the packaging or the product um, is the, the, the person or the brand who sells it into California. So, um, and there is no person who is the producer of a single-use packaging or priority single-use product for the purposes of subparagraph A, which is the producer is the person who imports them or is the owner or licensee of the trademark. It's basically, I know CalRecycle. They, they like the three-tiered definition. It's basically the three-tiered definition from British Columbia. It's the producer, and if not the producer, the um, brand owner or the importer. Are, what CPR bills would you consider to be great bills? And I'll leave this open to any of you to respond to. I can say this, Heidi, since I, I'm just one, it's our SB212 was an amazing bill. And to me, that's a true EPR bill that has internalized costs, strong enforcement, um, producers design, run, uh, and promote the program. And the government does their role, which is uh, set the performance standards, uh, ensure transparency, and uh, provide oversight and enforcement. And Cole or Sarah, do you want to add to that? Um, sure. Well, this is Sarah. Um, thinking about Maine, um, our, our paint care program is uh, relatively new compared to our other programs, but I think you know it's 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 really being it's successful. And I think 
one of the key things about it is that the industry really came forward and helped to um, shape it in a way so that it would be successful and they were totally on board. So I think that that really made um, a big a big difference for that program. And this is Heidi, if I could build off of what uh, Sarah said, it's important to note though that like in California, we were the first ones to pass it without a sunset and they did. And while it's the best uh, visible fee program for sure, it um, we did have some early bumps with contracting and then we also had a big bump when we didn't think it was right that they sued the state because they didn't like the oversight regs and then paid for also the state to defend that uh, lawsuit and then they appealed it and paid for both sides again out of the fee. I would encourage everybody if you're even thinking about using a visible fee program to make sure that you talk to me and get the parameters set up for how they can use that money because if you don't that might happen to you too. And I've already flagged that I might want to amend that bill so we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's more than that too. So let's okay. All right. I amend that. And Sarah um, question for you regarding Maine's approach, will the bill standardize the list of materials to be collected? And a second part, how will fragmentation be avoided? Um, standardize the materials collected. Um, I don't suspect, I don't know, I don't think it would be something that would be put in the statutory language. Um, that strikes me as something that would be put in the program plan that the product uh, producer responsibility organization would have to present back to DEP because um, that's going to change and you don't want to have to change the statute every single time um, and how those but the statute could dictate how that list is created um, for me I think it's necessary that the facilities that are in Maine collecting the material be part of that um, discussion in a way that they are not right now okay Okay. Another question um, is, do governmental agencies identify end markets in their state and region to link the recycling message on acceptable, on acceptable materials with viable end users for these materials? And so this is a uh, question open to any of you. Can you repeat it? I'm not sure I understand what the question is. Are government agencies connecting to the end markets? Is that the question? Your access. Oh. I think we lost it. Oh, Lynn. The access code you entered is invalid. Yeah, you I'm, entered. Sorry, One, I'm having please trouble. Please re-enter your I access code followed on. by the pound or hash sign. Okay. Well, uh, so the question you is. Entered. No digits. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. Sorry well, about this. To, are you there? All right. Um, I, I'll just try to answer that. Maybe Sarah, you can help me. But um, yes. Nicole, but I think government agencies to me are not who should be responsible for finding markets. <laughs> it should be the producers. And that's why the one thing. Um, our current bill does not have as funding, unless it's a pure EPR approach that CalRecycle chooses, there's no funding. And there was a discussion at the hearing this morning about how are they gonna fund infrastructure and they need a separate bill. And I was thinking to myself, no, because the producers should be helping, they need to make sure there's infrastructure. If they're selling something, they need to make sure that there's a closed loop. And that means they need to be looking to make sure that there is recycling and processing and remanufacturing for their products. So I don't know if that gets to that question, but I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. Right. So, yeah, I'm glad you said that because that was my initial reaction, too. Um, it is, yeah, that should not be the role of government. Um, and in fact, that's part of the problem, um, that it's nobody's job to do that. And it should not be a taxpayer funded job to do that. Um, so, you know, even this summer, as an example, we had an intern at NRCM um, spend her summer uh, trying to figure out what towns in Maine accept what recycled materials and that's just you know access it might be um, they have access to recycling but it's once a month and they have trash uh, access every week something like that so um, you know part of the the results of that you know it's really interesting um, to see what's recyclable where but um, 
the fact that nobody is nobody's job to do that now is just um, it's a, a, the point that I'm trying to make, I guess, um, that it should be someone's job to keep track of that year to year, uh, communicate um, so that we actually have an idea. Um, you know, like you said, you can't ma manage what you can't measure. Hey, it's so cool. I can add a little a, bit on that as well. Oh, go ahead, Paul. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I would largely agree that, you know, it's um, statutorily not the responsibility of the majority of states. And I think, um, Marianne, you can probably point folks to the link. NERC uh, has a great resource out there about state uh, waistbands and, you know, recycling mandates. And if I'm not mistaken, it's just a minority of state agencies that actually do mandate certain types of recycling or have uh, specific bans on recyclable materials. And so, outside of that framework, state agencies are not going to get involved um, where they those things are in place. Uh, Massachusetts, for example, you know, we do have a disposal ban on glass. And so last year when there were some market issues with glass, uh, our state DEP did assess you know, regional market availability when they were deciding whether or not to issue disposal waivers for that. And that's come up from time to time. But for the most part, no, states aren't involved. Um, where that conversation has started to happen a little bit, though, is some states are looking at um, uh, standardized recommended lists, material lists statewide. Uh, Massachusetts, again, did that. They got seven of the eight major MRFs here in the state to get together and agree to a list that is now being um, used as guidance in contract negotiations. Florida has worked on that, Connecticut, and I'm sure I'm forgetting someone else. Um, so there's a little bit of that, but yeah, for the most part, state agencies are not in that role. And it sounds like right folks don't feel that they should be perhaps anyway, but I would not necessarily look to them to have those answers. And I want to mention that we did get a response to the question about Vermont's um, straw ban, and the response was from someone from Vermont a and and his response is nursing homes and independent living facilities are exempt from the straw prohibition. So I think that answers that question. Um, another question for Sarah, can you talk more about the verification of recycling and how you will track the materials? Um, yes, I wish I had an exact answer for that, but that's, um, I just, I mostly flagged that as something that is of concern here and that's something that uh, DEP wants to make sure is explicit um, in, uh, in the language that they present. Um, you know, for instance, say that uh, that report that our intern um, did over the summer, let's say they found that, um, you know, uh, there's a lot more access to number one and number two uh, plastic recycling and uh, less access to number three through sevens. Um, but, you know, once you go a step further, further than our report did, a lot of those three through sevens may be accepted as recycling, but they're not actually getting recycled. They might be going to, you know, one other facility that pulls out the number fives and then the rest is um, incinerated. So it's um, it's more of an open question, I guess. How far um, do you track that? Um, how yeah, and, and, you know, maybe there are some cases where, um, you know, maybe with glass where recycling, you know, some towns have indicated that they still want to be able to use that as uh, fill. And, you know, how do we deal with um, the definition of recycling and um, and all of that? So I guess, yeah, my that's my vague, um, unknowing response that we will have an answer for by December. And I just wanted to uh, let everyone know, because I've been getting some questions about the recording and the presentations. They will be available on NERC's website by tomorrow afternoon. You will all receive the, the link to where you can find them on our site, so no need to worry about that. Uh, I have a question for Heidi. How is the closing of RePlanet going to impact the program in California? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think also, I, I just want to highlight why I think it closed, because the bill is 30 years old for the bottle bill, and again, it was a government-run program with very little producer payment that was very specific, it was many, many pages long, and it had three different formulas in it, which means it's very inflexible. And if the thing that's, a, to me, what I love about EPR is that the producers have the freedom to design and run the program, and they can change rapidly to changes in markets, material types, et cetera. Whereas when you have a very rigid bill like that, you have to constantly tweak it. We've, I think, fixed it 60 times, literally in law, and it's never really working. So um, the, what, what it did was it, I think, has given an extra push 
to getting these bills passed into the governor because everybody realizes we're in a crisis. We just lost so many recycling centers. The public cannot get their deposits back. And the places where they can get them back are now so overwhelmed with people coming in that they've literally, some of them have had to stop taking it because it was causing traffic problems. Um, we have in this current bill, some of the new last minute language that got added actually were big amendments on pack on these bottles and cans. So one of them is uh, addressing our Alcoholic Beverage Control Act and actually um, says that the act uh, now authorizes the department to suspend or revoke the certificate of compliance um, if with the our existing uh, laws on beverage, uh, if they're not complying with this litter reduction act. It also uh, changed at the last minute the authority. Um, it said specifically you could roll the existing R rigid plastic packaging uh, container, the RPPC law, into Cal Recycle could choose to roll it into whatever uh, program they decide to implement through the regs. But it did also then, so that would include the bottle bill too, but now the legislation says that it is um, not going to allow the bottle bill to be rolled into uh, this program until. 2026. So, um, and I'm literally looking at the bill because everything has changed so quickly. But that that is another very big change. Um, and yeah, so January 1 of 2026, beverage containers subject to the Beverage Container Recycling and Litter Reduction Act um, will not be rolled into this program until 2026. So that how it's changed our discussion is one, everybody's feeling pressure, including the legislators. Uh, the public is upset and they're telling their legislators. So it's helped really spawn keeping this bill moving. But now, you know, the legislators obviously are concerned and even said at the hearing today that, you know, there's so many moving parts, they're afraid they're gonna do it wrong, but they're also afraid of not doing anything. So, uh, we, again, encourage them to pass this legislation. And if there's needs to be tweaks later, let there be tweaks later on big bills. You always have them. But um, generally, it's really going in the right direction, we think. And I have a question for Sarah. Could you describe the process or the direction for determining the modulated fees? Um, sure. Well, again, that's going to be something um, that I will not have a super clear answer to. Um, the, 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 the bill that the DEP comes out with um, basically needs to be relatively prescriptive um, in the intent of what the, the purpose of the fees are um, based on certain criteria, say that I listed in my, um, in my slide there. And then, um, you know, in looking at how other jurisdictions do this, um, you know they they set the fees you know year to year on different material types um, based on the criteria in the in in the statute um, so and then that would have to get approved by the DEP um, or relayed to the DEP an annual report in which case the DEP could um, recommend changes to the statute that fix anything that maybe isn't going as it was intended. Um, so that might be the best answer um, that I have uh, for that question. Okay, and this question goes out to all of you. How do you envision citizens' day-to-day -day lives or experiences changing when EPR programs go into effect? Will they still have the blue bins? Will they be doing more take back? Uh, you know, product take back to the store? Will they be mailing certain materials? What's your thought on that? This is Heidi. I'll, I guess I'll start because I was just in Canada looking at all of this. Um, one of the things that they, they have found in British Columbia where they have 22 EPR programs for everything from lawn equipment to large appliances and bottles and cans is often the public has no idea the producers are running the program. Um, 
they don't really care that what they want is convenient programs that are clearly understandable and easy to follow and free at end of life. So they're not having to pay when it's time for disposal or you know bringing it to collection. Um, so I think it's really going to vary among, uh, if we're speaking specifically on packaging, I think what they're gonna see in the long term, not necessarily in the short term, is that they're gonna have a lot less variety of packaging. And that will be a good thing because they have been very, very confused over all this uh, labeling and the chasing arrows that implies it's recyclable and there's no place to recycle it and it's not got a market. I think the labeling is going to get a lot better really fast. And I think it's going to be a lot cleaner and a lot less material types and a lot easier to identify for us in the system. Now, whether that's a change in, uh, they're going to want to keep it clean. So I know in some programs like in Belgium, they separate the glass. And in some places, many like in California, we've gone to all, everything in one blue bin. But what that's done is scrambled an egg that you can't unscramble. You've, you've basically broken glass into paper. The paper isn't recyclable. The glass isn't recyclable. I think we may have to go back to some form of um, separation where there's dry recyclables in one container. The glass is separated by color uh, in a different way because that's how you keep it clean and keep the markets up and keep the cost of the system down. Um, but I, I, there's many changes that could happen. And I know it's scary when you don't know exactly what's gonna happen. But to me, that we have to be more flexible. If we just wanna put out there, this is the one right way and everybody has to do this, then um, it's never gonna work with a flexible market where uh, manufacturers can sell really whatever they want onto the market. Sorry, I can't be mm -hmm. more <laughs> clear about it's exactly going to be this or that because there's no way to know. But we just know how it's worked in other places and it's worked very well. Sarah and, or Cole, would you like to add to that? Um, I, I can add just a minute. Um, so uh, to me, I think the most uh, short term immediate uh, change will be that um, your municipality may not abandon their recycling program um, because they know that their costs will be reimbursed. Um, we are seeing um, every day in Maine recycling programs taking less materials, um, stopping completely all siting costs, um, and even talking to municipalities now, um, they're excited. They're signing supportive resolutions for this bill because they will not have to make the choice about um, to recycle or not um, based on costs. So immediately, people may actually have a recycling program, and um, longer term, hopefully um, all of the other benefits that um, that Heidi uh, mentioned, including less variety and less confusion. Paul, did you have anything more you wanted to add to that? Uh, sure, yeah, I, I would uh, agree with all those comments. The other one, and pardon if this has been raised, I was offline for a moment, I think we'll see more uh, discussion about chemical recycling, quote unquote chemical recycling, I'm hearing that a lot from the folks in the plastic sector is something they think could potentially be a solution for some of this packaging. I don't know how that will fit in some of the regulatory structures and what the environmental profile is of that. There's a lot to learn there still, but I would anticipate more discussion about that. Um, and yeah, it would be it would be very interesting to see the cost structures here. Um, the other thing it, I would say is uh, more to come in other states, obviously, uh, you know, if, uh, as we see what plays out in New England as well as California, uh, I would anticipate more states will follow in the uh, legislative session next year. I'm already hearing um, that's very likely. The next question uh, really goes out to all of you. Are any of you aware of uh, strategies that might fit areas that are geographically isolated with little to no recycle recycling infrastructure? This is Heidi. Um, that's what EPR does. It addresses all of that. And as uh, Sarah brought up, they've got mo most of Maine is rural. Um, and so they are not setting goals by um, percentages of recycling. They have to do it by region because otherwise they're not going to have, you know, the, and that's again, getting back to the devil is in the details of a bill. The rules have to be protected. Otherwise they will not 
get the service because it's never going to be the most cost effective way to get the collections to happen. So you have to make sure the laws are set up so that the rural areas have the same level of service as the urban areas. And in Canada, in British Columbia, where I just was, most of the population is in Vancouver, and it's very, very rural in the rest of the province, but every single area is served, and they have convenience standards to ensure that. But again, that's the devil in the details of the loss. You've got to make sure the devil is not there, <laughs> and you've protected the rural areas through the law. Sarah, did you want to add to that? Um, no, I think that Heidi um, yeah, summed up what I was going to say. Um, you know, and I will say, even talking to municipalities and the municipal association, that um, is a huge issue for them. They want to make sure that it's um, equitable and um, that acts and that access is definitely definitely a part of um, this uh, proposal. Yes, yeah, Sam, I'll leave it there. I'm sorry, repeat repeat that, Cole? I was just gonna, I'll, I'll leave it there. I think they've covered it well. Okay. So the next question is, um, how do the EPR approaches address imported packaging um, and enforce compliance when the packaging producers are from outside of the country. This is Heidi, I can take that. Um, you guys can build on it, but it's it's very easy. I mean, basically we, we know when things cross our financial borders, whether it's a catalytic converter to be put on a car in California or whether something got shipped in and sold in California. And that's why um, the law, as we have it written, it will allow the state to um, ban uh, you know, take some of these beer products off of the of being certified to be sold in California. Um, so we know it doesn't matter where they make it, it's where it's sold. And if it's sold in your state, you have the authority and you know how to track it. Your finance department does it for taxes and everything else. You know when it crosses that line and then you can impose fines or you can ban them from selling altogether, which is what we're doing in our bill. It actually, uh, in California, I shouldn't say our bill, like we were running it again, it's author sponsored bills, but the way they've set it up is there's registration with the state. Um, they have to pay into it. If they uh, fail to meet the performance standards in the program, the state will put up a list of non-compliant companies. Doesn't matter where they are, just matters where they're selling. And that's in, in California. And then the retailers cannot sell those products on that list. They have to look. So uh, that that's how we're doing it in our bill. Right. So um, I can build off that, Heidi. I um, th that's pretty much what I was going to say. It's uh, easy, especially because you're already tracking it um, from the financial borders. I like that term. Um, but uh, it's typically in the other product stewardship programs. Um, it, it's relatively self-regulating too. Um, producers that pay into a system don't want free riders paying in. Um, and some of our other programs uh, have language in there that they're they're entitled to have a, a you know private right of action that they could sue other companies who aren't paying into the system. So um, that's just something I would add to what Heidi said. Okay. And then one last question, and this one's for Sarah. Sarah, what is the proposed cost share formula between producers and local governments? Um, that's a good question. So the um, the Resolve Bill said that DEP needs to propose um, statutory language that has the producers paying at least 80% of the costs. And um, so it could be 80 or it could be um, anywhere between there and 100. And um, what what I saw the last concept um, released by DEP, that they were considering more, um, more on the 100% reimbursement. Um, and the reason that it was back at 80 is because they, uh, you know, it, it's, a great idea to have the municipalities have some sort of skin in the game so that they are um, incentivized to have an efficient program. Um, so you can't just 
have this, you know, huge contract that you give out to someone you know and get it reimbursed, um, you know, to avoid things like that. So that, that's the reason why it was at 80. And if you do it um, at 100 percent and then instead have municipalities reimbursed, um, not by their actual cost, but by an average cost, this is something that they do in Quebec, um, so that um, municipalities who have a really efficient system, maybe below average cost system, may actually get a little bit more than they actually spent. And then the municipalities who have a really inefficient, expensive program would have to pay to have that inefficient um, system. Okay. I know I said that was the last question, but another one came in and we haven't talked about it yet. And this one is for Heidi. How will the California bill accommodate e-commerce? Thinking back, if I saw anything about e-commerce, I don't think I saw anything about e-commerce in the bill, so that means it's going to be kicked to the uh, to the regulatory process. So it's going to be addressed for sure, because as we all know, there's more and more uh, issues with the packaging from e-commerce that's changing the entire waste stream to brown and cardboard, and the overpackaging that we're seeing. So uh, I believe this bill does not address it directly, so therefore it's got to be in the regs process. Okay. Well, I, I would like to thank our speakers and for everyone who has um, remained on the webinar and posted such great questions. This has been a very rich conversation and I believe all of you will appreciate the uh, recording and the presentations, which again will be posted on NERC's website tomorrow. I also wanted to let you know that this is the first webinar about packaging, and we have two more coming up in the near future. On October 24th, we'll be focusing on Canadian packaging EPR, and on December 5th, European packaging EPR. So a chance to learn more about the different models that are out there for packaging. And I hope you will join us for those as well. But I thank you all and have a good afternoon. Thank you for hosting. I think this was very timely and useful for everyone. Appreciate being on. Yep, thank you.